Good morning, everybody. Thank you, as always, for being with us. Hope you had a really great uh, holiday weekend. Happy Juneteenth again. Um, of course, Pride Month, we're celebrating. Continue to celebrate, so happy Pride Month. And hopefully, uh, everybody is, uh, doesn't ha hopefully you don't have to be on campus today. You're doing okay, staying away from the power outages we're dealing with right now. Um, and thanks to all our leadership in the hospital, keeping us updated. Uh, next, I'm gonna turn it over to our Associate Chair for Inclusion, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Dunn. Thanks for being with us as always. Good morning. On this short week due to recognition of Juneteenth, I hope that people were able to celebrate in whatever way they saw fit. And that those of you who were not so familiar with Juneteenth, I hope you were able to educate yourselves and on its history. I also hope that next year the university will properly recognize it as a federal holiday. That said, I wanna remind you that we will be co-hosting with the OFDD and the REACH Network um, a discussion based on the Black Men in White Coats documentary. The filmmaker, Dr. Dale Okorodudu, will be doing a Q&A along with Dr. Rob Dodd from Neurosurgery and Dr. Donald Golden from the Roots Clinic. Even if you've not seen the documentary, we urge you to join what promises to be an excellent discussion. And that Q&A is gonna take place tomorrow virtually from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And I'll be placing the link in the chat. I also want to remind you that the new cycle of Department of Medicine Chair Diversity Awards, um, the Investigator Awards, that's open for proposals. The awards are going to be $50,000 each and are for instructors or assistants from any line. They will support research that addresses health equity, social determinants of health, cultural competence, outcomes improvement, health system access and utilization for racial, ethnic, and sexual and gender minorities, among many other possibilities. So we hope to receive proposals that will demonstrate a benefit to individuals from underserved communities or populations. The proposals are due next Thursday, June 30th, and I will of course put the link to the application portal in the chat. And finally, to round out Pride Month, the Stanford Center for CME, the HEAL Network, the Stanford REACH Initiative, and the Stanford Medicine Diversity Committee, the GME one, will co-host the Building a Culture of Health Equity lecture series that will feature a fireside chat panel that will look at health equity research in the LGBTQ plus community. The event is gonna be moderated by Dr. Leslie Subak and will feature Drs. Tandy I, Mitchell Lunn, and Juno Obedin Malaver. So with that, those are all my announcements. Happy Pride. Thanks so much, Dr. Dunn. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys are able to join. Special shout out to Dr. Golden, who I know is part of, who's part of this and always with us in Grand Rounds. I know he's here with us today. So thanks for um, always attending and asking great, great questions. I want to briefly mention uh, next week, uh, we do have a special Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, we're doing a panel, uh, the, the, the title, Promoting Health Through Integrated Care, Role of Health Psychologists. Uh, you may have remembered we did have um, a recent uh, topic on this. Uh, and we decided to expand it to a lot of our psychologists that are without many divisions, throughout many divisions in the department. We're really excited about this, Dr. Barwick, Dr. Uh, Tannenbaum, uh, Purport King, and uh, Sears Edwards. I'm really excited to hear from all of them. So we're going to have a, a full panel where they're going to chat a little bit about uh, what they do individually, but mostly open this up for Q&A and really have a discussion about the role uh, that they play in, in care. And we all know how important and vital that is. So really excited about that one next week. Uh, so um, that being said, we're really excited to hear from Dr. Shintaja today. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Nadeau who's gonna be introducing her. Dr. Nadeau has, as you probably know, has been with us through the pandemic, helping set up our MGRs with vaccines, helping us deal with uh, the air quality and all sorts of various aspects. She's been a huge uh, aspect of supporting uh, Grand Round. So thanks, Dr. Nando, for introducing Dr. Shinsaja today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's an honor and privilege to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Shintraja. Uh, Dr. Shintraja is going to be talking about innovations in food allergy through a multi-targeted approach. And she's an associate professor, double boarded in pulmonary critical care and allergy, asthma and immunology. She's world recognized in her field. She's a world leader uh, and is part of the program project grant consortium at the NIH for food allergy. She's also the director of clinical research at our center. And she's published over 70 original papers. 
She sits on many committees at the NIH level, at the international committee level, at the American Thrust Society. And in addition, she's been awarded many teaching awards and she's been an incredible service to teaching and patient care here at Stanford. And I feel so lucky to be able to introduce her today and to call her my colleague. So thank you, Dr. Shintraja. We look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Kari, um, for that very warm introduction. And I am very excited to be um, here with you all. Let me share my slides. Okay. Can everybody see that? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, it's my pleasure to join you today to talk about a lot of the work we've been doing at the center um, nationally and internationally uh, to really help uh, food allergic patients. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, none of which uh, should really impact my talk today. And I'll cover a lot of ground, um, but I look forward to any questions. And I'll start off with the current state of food allergy. So 90% um, of food allergic individuals are allergic to the nine top foods, but 90% of life-threatening reactions are to peanuts or tree nuts. And growing up, I used to take peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to school. And now my own children you know, are not allowed uh, to bring nut products um, into their schools or daycares. And it's a very different, uh, different world because Food allergy, I would say, uh, is an epidemic um, across the globe um, that was occurring even prior to COVID. It affects 6 million kids in the United States. It's a major growing issue. So that's roughly two kids in every classroom. I think most of us here uh, know somebody with food allergy, either within your own family or, or friends uh, circle. Uh, it also can affect adults, so you can have new onset food allergies, and currently in the U.S., one out of 10 adults are affected. There's been a 50% rise uh, in the diagnosis of food allergy over the last 20 years. Uh, it's more than just peanuts, um, as I'm showing you here. Uh, the top nine, uh, and it used to be top eight, but top nine are now milk, egg, wheat, soy, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and sesame. And really importantly, uh, most food allergic patients, um, at least a third, are allergic to more than one food. Uh, and at Stanford in our center, I would say 70% of the food allergic individuals who come to us are allergic to more than one food. We think the increase in prevalence uh, and incidence of food allergy is a combination of genetic environmental factors. At Prevention is a real opportunity. A landmark study in 2018 called the LEAP study, learning early about peanut, um, showed that early introduction of peanut into the diet of infants, um, so infants less than one, could actually reduce the risk of developing peanut allergy by age five. Um, and there's more data to suggest that early introduction of a diverse diet has the same benefit but we are diagnosing food allergy uh, to peanuts and other foods more commonly now, and uh, therapies are in development. So I'll spend a lot more of my talk uh, talking about the therapies that are currently available and in the pipeline. Uh, importantly is to try and understand how we diagnose food allergy. So um, if you have seasonal allergies, you may have seen an allergist for skin prick tests where we prick you, um, with needles uh, just to see if we can elicit a reaction from mast cells in your skin where they release histamine and we get a little swelling or a hive with some redness. Um, there can be blood tests that look at IgE antibodies to specific proteins uh, that are um, reactive in foods uh, or pollen proteins and pollens from the environment. But really the gold standard is the oral food challenge. And what that means is that we take the suspected food that we think that you're allergic to based on your clinical history and your skin prick tests and your blood tests. And then we do a supervised feeding in the clinic. And we give you small amounts of that food and monitor you for an allergic reaction. So it seems archaic, um, but that's uh, the best test that we currently have. It's time consuming and it's hugely anxiety pr provoking. 
um, for the patient and the family. Uh, there are other diagnostic tests that are promising that are currently in the pipeline, basal activation tests, which I'll tell you more about, um, done uh, here at Stanford by Steve Galley in his lab and Kari Nato in her labs, um, but mainly in the research setting, uh, mast cell activation tests and uh, epitoped based assays. Um, so there's promise that perhaps we can move away from uh, the food challenge. How do we recognize an allergic reaction? So there is a difference between food intolerance versus food allergy. And food allergy is IgE mediated. So it's a different biologic uh, pathway. And typically patients experience allergic reactions or symptoms within 30 minutes of eating the food up to two hours. And the most common are skin or GI symptoms. It's kind of your body's natural way of trying to expel the food. Um, so feeling nauseous or a little bit of a tummy ache or, or vomiting um, or, or hives, but more concerning would be uh, pulmonary reactions like coughing or wheezing or cardiovascular reactions with uh, hypotension uh, due to anaphylaxis. Because of all of this, and food is um, part of every race, ethnic, social culture, uh, there's a lot of anxiety. Um, and food allergy impacts not only the physical, mental, and emotional health of the affected patient. Uh, there are dietary restrictions. So um, patients, uh, uh, children, and adults may feel excluded from uh, social events. There can be bullying at school. Families make choices to avoid certain restaurants, um, change family traditions, skip out on school functions or work events, um, or avoid traveling because of their food allergy and the fear of an accidental ingestion. Um, and if you're allergic to more than one food, you have more than one opportunity for an accidental ingestion. So there's a lot of anxiety. It also costs the US healthcare system $25 billion a year, about $4,000 per child diagnosed with food allergy. And that's due to emergency room visits, um, purchasing special foods from sometimes specialty markets, um, the cost of epinephrine auto injectors. Uh, and that does, doesn't even account for different factors such as parents changing job situations to be readily available um, to, you know, um, deal with an uh, uh, allergic reaction at school um, or on the playground for one of their kids. So our team in collaboration with Jeremy Balenson and Tom Caruso um, looked to find different ways to deal with the anxiety uh, during a food challenge. This work is led by Will Collins on our team. Um, and funded by an MCHRI pilot grant to use augmented reality to reduce anxiety during oral food challenges, um, which is key for the diagnosis of uh, food allergy and also key for inclusion in many of our clinical trials. Um, so oftentimes we do blinded food challenges where we have the real food on one day and a placebo food on a different day to ensure that the patient is truly allergic and then uh, when they go through the clinical trial at the end, the main outcome of interest in our clinical trials are food challenges as well, to see um, how we've improved the threshold sensitivity. You know, how much more can the individual tolerate after a therapeutic clinical trial? And um, this is a patient here I'm gonna highlight. She's wearing um, the augmented reality headset device and uh, working with the virtual lab um, we were able to create a, a program. Um, this is a little wood nymph uh, um, that includes a game. Uh, and Marlene is one of our coordinators uh, who's pictured here with Alyssa. Uh, and the handset um, is seen during the game. And the handset actually has a spoon attached to it with the food that the patient uh, is allergic to. 
Um, and we're trying to eliminate the anxiety and the fear associated with the food challenges um, by putting them into a virtual space. Uh, and semi-successfully, I would say, about 75% of people who've tried this in this pilot study have mentioned that they weren't really thinking about what they were eating because they were busy um, playing the game. So this is an exciting um, you know, pilot for us to explore different options to reduce anxiety during these stressful times. Uh, next, I'll talk about limitations associated with our current therapies. So current management of food allergy, the mainstay is allergen avoidance. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a risk of accidental exposure. This can be challenging and expensive. And then carrying reaction medications with you at all times. So the mainstay is epinephrine auto injector, uh, and this requires training. Uh, you have to have it on hand at all times when you're eating. Um, and, you know, there are many studies looking out uh, of how many people actually with a diagnosis of food allergy fill uh, their epinephrine auto injector prescription, which, you know, the injector expires after a year. Um, and so roughly a third of food allergic patients actually fill their prescriptions yearly. Um, less than that uh, often carry them with them at all times. Um, and then in a situation that would require the use of epinephrine auto injector, um, there's uh, only a fraction, 7% of um, children have had to use them uh, and, and use them appropriately. So these are the limitations with our current system. Um, oral immunotherapy is definitely a promising approach. Uh, and what I'm showing you here are little cups um, that our manufacturing facility in the Sean and Parker Center uh, has measured out. And um, this is hazelnut protein. And we start off with a very small dose over here um, and increasing amounts uh, of that protein and uh, that's very carefully characterized in a manufacturing facility. And the idea behind oral immunotherapy is to induce desensitization, where regular consumption of the culprit food is needed to allow for its safe intake. And the, the doses, the first time you try a dose, it's supervised to ensure that there's no, um, no allergic reaction. Uh, and then the patient is sent home with those doses to take at home daily for a week or two weeks, and then come back into the clinic to increase to the next step. Um, and over time, we're able to build them up to uh, a, per, potentially even a serving size of the food that they were once allergic to. So food oral immunotherapy started in 2008 in a first randomized controlled study. It's a long process. It can take one to three years for one food um, for desensitization to have effect. Uh, you can still have allergic reactions um, to these doses at home or in the clinic. Uh, GI side effects are very common because it's lining the um, gut epithelium. And because of that, there's a high dropout rate. And what people are really, I think, shooting for is not a desensitized state, but what we're talking about is tolerance or what in the field we called sustained unresponsiveness, where you can avoid, you can go through the desensitization process with oral immunotherapy, avoid the food for a period of time, but assess whether we permanently change the immune system to be non-reactive uh, to that food. And it's, you know, our working definition of a cure um, and whether this exhibits long-term or permanent loss of the sensitivity to the allergen um, is, is really what we're uh, trying to understand. Um, I'm gonna tell you about the first peanut oral immunotherapy that's been approved by the FDA in 2020. This was from a landmark study in 2018 where uh, 500 children, four to 17, were given peanut powder, which is AR101 or placebo, and uh, underwent oral immunotherapy where they built up to 300 milligrams of the peanut powder or placebo. And one peanut is roughly 300 milligrams. And then they took that dose daily for another six months. And what's really amazing is that at the end of one year, 50% could actually tolerate 1,000 milligrams 
Um, so three times the amount that they were taking on a daily basis uh, compared to the placebo, which was um, less than 5%. However, there were a fair number of dropouts from this phase three study uh, because of the GI side effects. Um, this begs the question of what do we do after oral immunotherapy? What is the lifelong plan? Um, and so this led us to do the POI study, which was running at the same time of uh, the, the uh, Palisade study. Um, it was a single center study, uh, and we had some all-stars on our team here, Kari Nado, Steve Galley, and Scott Boyd funded through a U19 mechanism um, through the NIH to do this clinical trial and look at mechanisms associated with successful outcomes. Um, we looked at 120 children and adults, seven to 53. All of these uh, participants at baseline were really allergic to peanut. You know, they reacted at one tenth of a peanut, um, and they were randomized to two arms of placebo, uh, two arms of peanut, or uh, one arm of placebo, where they built up to four grams of peanut or placebo over the course of the first year. Um, that's roughly one tablespoon of peanut butter and then maintained four grams daily of peanut or placebo over the course of the second year, and then dropped their dose either to avoidance to assess sustained unresponsiveness or one peanut a day um, to you know, think about what is a um, feasible long-term dosing option uh, and avoidance. And uh, this, is, this is the study design here um, where we're building up and then maintaining. And then in this third year, after they dropped the dose, we did food challenges every three months to assess responses. Um, all along the way, we were able to collect um, blood and different biosamples and bank them to really try and understand mechanisms associated with these different clinical outcomes. Um, and what we were not truly surprised, but interested to find is that the threshold to be, remain non-reactive to four grams of peanut decreases over time when you avoid peanut. So we haven't permanently changed the switch in the majority. That's this green, green line here, the peanut zero arm. 13% actually achieved sustained unresponsiveness for a year, which was amazing. Um, and that um, the ability to tolerate a tablespoon of peanut butter when you're only taking one peanut um, a day also decreases over time. This is the peanut 300 arm that I'm showing you here. And that's roughly 35% um, over the course of the year. Uh, so there is a threshold of, um, you know, a decay curve essentially of the ability to tolerate high doses of peanut over time. Um, but what was really important is that we kind of set the bar really high, four grams of peanut. Um, but most patients and families, I think, are, are interested in being protected against a small bite uh, or an accidental ingestion. And 95% of those who continued with one peanut a day were able to tolerate much more than when they had originally started. Um, and so that, that's uh, really important. Um, as I mentioned, we collect blood and biosamples, and this is work by Mindy Sai and Kyori Mackay, um, looking at basophil activation and uh, looking at IgE as well, and lower basophil activation and peanut-specific IgE at baseline were associated with better outcomes after peanut oral immunotherapy. Because it would be wonderful to understand who um, has are there biomarkers that can actually predict outcomes um, and give us hints as to what the long-term maintenance dosing should be? So um, oral immunotherapy, the benefits are the majority of people can become desensitized. Remission um, or sustained unresponsiveness is um, possible, but only in a few. And perhaps um, you know, more achievable in younger age groups um, and that's from an impact study that I didn't show you. There's limitations, it's a slow process, there's GI side effects. It's allergen specific, so you have to do peanut, um, but if you're multi-allergic, then you have to do multiple foods. Um, and so one possible solution we thought uh, was to try to see a combination approach 
with a biologic, which targets um, allergic inflammation. And uh, that could be IG, anti-IgE biologic because food allergy is an IgE-mediated disease um, or an anti-allergic inflammation uh, biologic like dupilumab, which targets cytokines that lead to IgE production such as IL-4 or IL-13 or even higher um, at the epithelial level where the first signals happen with alarmins um, kind of alerting the immune system um, to skew towards allergic um, phenomenons. And so uh, we've now done over 35 studies uh, across all ages, and I'm uh, excited to tell you about some of that. So um, what I wanna spend the remainder of the talk um, highlighting our safety and efficacy data in investigational therapies for prevention and management of food allergies. And I think I mentioned uh, the LEAP study, which was about early introduction of peanut. And so there is this dual allergen hy hypothesis or exposure theory, um, really from our colleagues in London, uh, Gideon Lack and Helen Brough, um, where we think that uh, oral exposure of foods early in life can actually skew away from allergy and is really important. And this is a paradigm shift. The LEAP study with early introduction of peanut reducing the risk of developing peanut allergy was a huge paradigm shift in our thinking that led to changes in guidelines um, and our pediatric colleagues and our family medicine colleagues uh, now spend a lot of time talking about introduction of solid foods, you know, at the four month visit, you know, and six month visit. Um, uh, and we think that that can actually promote tolerance, whereas exposure through skin and especially through damaged skin, that skin epithelial barrier is really important. And if food is exposed through the skin in early life, especially if there's dry skin or if allergy has already kind of shown itself in a baby through eczema, um, that that might actually skew the immune system towards recognizing foods as um, uh, allergic foreign components. And so this is where our prevention study is really trying to make, um, make a difference here is looking at the um, skin, uh, skin as an opportunity um, to prevent food allergy. So the SEAL study is stopping eczema and allergy. Um, and it, the idea is proactive skin care targeting infants at high risk for atopic dermatitis and food allergy will maintain normal skin barrier function and thus prevent the transcutaneous allergen sensitization and the development of food allergy. And this is just a few members from the Stanford team um, who are involved in this, uh, including um, our, uh, our coordinators and regulatory manager and Manisha from the QSU. This is a 750 uh, participant study um, across four sites internationally um, with Gideon Lack and his team at, uh, and Helen Bra um, at Guy St. Thomas and uh, Donald Young in uh, Denver, Chrissy Chow Chow in Chicago, and Tina Cinder and, and Kari at Stanford, um, and really looking at um, emollients and um, steroid ointments to treat uh, dry skin and eczema um, and see if we can prevent uh, the development of food allergy. So if food allergy is already set in, um, what are the therapeutic options be beyond oral immunotherapy? If we can target IgE antibodies, the drivers of food allergy, can we improve the disease? And uh, omalizumab uh, is the longest studied IgE. It's currently FDA approved for asthma and chronic idiopathic urticaria and has been extensively studied in pilot studies for the treatment of food allergy. And this is a list of you know, um, over 20 studies that have looked at either clinical trials using omalizumab in the setting of single um, food allergy or mechanisms associated with omalizumab in food allergy. And I highlight here the beginning um, really of uh, 
you know, what uh, Kari Nato was able to kind of think outside of the box to address multi-food. Um, and if we could decrease IgE with omalizumab and anti-IgE while we're introducing food, um, would we be able to improve the safety? And would we be able to desensitize people to more than one food simultaneously instead of sequentially, which um, had been uh, the practice before that? So I wanted to highlight one of our um, many phase one and phase two studies. Um, this phase two study is our uh, MTAC study, and it's omalizumab facilitated multi-allergen oral immunotherapy with um, follow-on OIT dosing patterns. And it was a multi-center study across seven sites enrolling 60 patients, um, children and adults with two to five foods. So everybody underwent baseline food challenges, then everybody received omalizumab for 16 weeks duration. So this is really like an umbrella cover or a pre-treatment to bring down IgE. Then at eight weeks, we introduce multi-food oral immunotherapy in a stepwise fashion um, and continue to increase uh, the uh, multi-allergen OIT over time to 1,000 milligrams top dose of each of the foods. And it could be anywhere from two to five foods, so 2,000 to 5,000 milligrams total. Um, omalizumab is stopped at the 16-week time point. Everybody underwent food challenges at week 30 to assess desensitization. You know, how high were they able to go on a food challenge for each of their foods? And then they were uh, randomized to avoidance, um, rough, you know, 300 milligrams, roughly one nut uh, a day or a thousand milligrams, and then underwent food challenges six weeks later. And what was exciting to see is that 85% of those who continued some dosing, so 1,000 milligrams or 300 milligrams, were able to pass food challenges to two foods up to two grams um, of those foods. So two or more foods up to two grams compared to 55% who uh, underwent avoidance. And so, um, you know, that was really exciting uh, to see. And we also actually tested to higher amounts to four grams. So here we are building up to one gram of each of the foods and testing to higher thresholds. And 70% were able to tolerate more than you know, four grams for two or more foods. Whereas those who had gone on to avoidance, 45% were able to pass that. And to put it into perspective, four grams of food is roughly a half a glass of milk, a slice of wheat toast, or a handful of nuts. And um, these, these multi-food allergic individuals are often very sensitive and allergic to, you know, just small amounts of each of these foods. So it's tremendous progress. Um, in a relatively short period of time, I wanted to highlight 36, 30 weeks really. Um, so less than a year to desensitize people to multiple foods. And what we also saw was there was improved safety um, uh, and, um, and compliance. What it did not help, uh, we realized, was with the GI side effects. We still saw that there were GI side effects during oral immunotherapy with this approach. Um, what we also looked at across all of our studies uh, is how much um, uh, are patients able to tolerate at these initial introductions of food. And 50% uh, are able to tolerate two, roughly two grams to 2380 milligrams. Um, of food, and then 50% are, are less than that. And I think what was interesting is in an IgE-mediated disease, what we were seeing was that there is a variability in response. So what that led us to question is, is that, you know, are we targeting the right dose of omalizumab? We were using asthma dosing for omalizumab. Um, and uh, are there patient characteristics that lend uh, to better response? So I want to highlight just one other study um, with omalizumab, which is our MIMAX study, alternative omalizumab dosing using um, chronic idiopathic urticaria dosing. So it's not IgE or weight-based dosing of omalizumab. It's just fixed dosing. So 150 milligrams every four weeks for three injections. 
And then patients, um, we looked at 60 patients across UCLA and Stanford, um, again, uh, with multi-food oral immunotherapy introduced, um, and then studying different maintenance doses, low dose uh, oral immunotherapy versus high dose oral immunotherapy, and then looking at biologic uh, immune outcomes. Um, so the primary endpoint here was an increase in um, a decrease in IgE and an increase in IgG4 to um, lend to a 25% increase in the ratio of IgG4 to IgE um, for at least two allergens. And we were successful in uh, inducing that in all of the patients. Um, so what do we know so far for anti-IgE? We know that it shortens the time to maintenance for oral immunotherapy dose but not the proportion of patients who are able to reach maintenance. We know that adverse events are still persistent, especially GI side effects. And then we need more data on optimal dosage and use in oral immunotherapy. We see quite a bit of variability you know, at eight weeks and at, at 30 weeks. Um, and, and is that due to drug dosage or is it due to patient characteristics? Um, if we treated with omalizumab for a longer duration, would we see um, more successful outcomes? So uh, very excited that we were able to um, uh, undergo and create a protocol funded by the NIH through the Consortium for Food Allergy Research um, for a phase three study with omalizumab uh, in collaboration with Genentech and Novartis who co-own uh, the drug. And this is a um, national study across 10 sites looking at 225 patients uh, to understand omalizumab by itself for multifood allergic individuals and omalizumab with multi-allergen oral immunotherapy outcomes. So stage one is looking at omalizumab by itself versus placebo for four months. Stage two is looking at a very similar design to what I showed you for the MTAC study, uh, facilitated where we have short period of omalizumab with multi-allergen oral immunotherapy versus omalizumab with placebo oral immunotherapy for one year. And then um, stage three, which is dietary food introduction, because really what we need to understand is the long-term dietary introduction of these foods in these food allergic individuals, um, does this remain a viable long-term um, option? And uh, I, uh, you know, I'm very excited to say that our um, SNP manufacturing team is the team that's actually manufacturing the oral immunotherapy for uh, these 225 patients across the 10 sites uh, in the United States. So. Uh, this study is ongoing. We're still currently enrolling um, and uh, very exciting um, uh, and promising for um, a biologic uh, indication for food allergy. Uh, omalizumab has been uh, a hard drug to replicate. Um, and the next generation of anti-IgE, currently it's the only anti-IgE that had been on the market for a very long time. Um, the next generation anti-IgE is called legalizumab. It's been studied in um, urticaria and in um, um, uh, nasal uh, rhinitis. And it uh, is better at blocking um, free IgE binding to the FC epsilon uh, R1 receptor, um, whereas omalizumab is better at binding um, of the free IgE to the CD23. So they have different binding sites with different functions. And currently, legalizumab is being studied in food allergy um, in a phase three study um, for, for peanut allergic patients. So I mentioned um, that uh, there are other biologics um, that can interrupt the allergic inflammatory cascades. So here's your epithelium. This is where um, allergens are interacting with your epithelium, be that at the skin or at the gut. Um, and your alarmins are the first responders triggering uh, an immune cascade, and that's TSLP, IL-25, and IL-33. Uh, we studied IL-33 in food allergy, which I'll highlight. And then um, 
Dupilumab is an anti IL-4 receptor alpha um, that works upstream of IgE production. There are many more biologics uh, that are being studied in food allergy, as well as different approaches for antigen specific responses, either by the mouth, um, sublingually, um, epicutaneously, so on the skin, um, or using modified food proteins as allergens. Uh, either by themselves or in combination with one of these um, biologics or uh, immune alterers. So the uh, field is evolving very quickly um, and there's been tremendous growth in the last decade, which is very exciting. And a lot of that is due to uh, increased funding from industry and from the NIH and um, philanthropy as well. So anti-L4 receptor alpha antibody dupilumab already has an indication in um, asthma and uh, in eczema um, and now EOE uh, and uh, is being studied in food allergy. It inhibits IL-4 and 13 and has downstream effects on B, class, B cell class switching um, for the production of uh, IgE. Um, there are a number of studies that are um, looking at this in food allergy um, and two Stanford-led studies, one uh, that's currently ongoing for milk uh, oral immunotherapy with dupilumab and a combination approach, which I'll tell you more about. Uh, and the idea here is whether dupilumab has the potential to target and help specifically more with GI side effects. Um, because we see that um, with oral immunotherapy, we're inducing a little more allergic inflammation um, before it decreases and whether dupilia may, might be able to blunt um, mechanisms that are associated with the GI side effects is very exciting and something we're very interested in. Um, the combined study is looking at a combination of biologics and oral immunotherapy. So if we pretreat with omalizumab and use that as a sponge to kind of uh, decrease freely circulating IgE from the circulation and use dupilumab as a dimmer to kind of dial down allergic inflammation and then add or multi-allergen oral immunotherapy, can we improve safety and efficacy? Uh, and that's the combined study that's funded by the NIH and our food allergy research uh, organization. It's a study across three sites in California, uh, currently ongoing, um, looking to enroll 110 um, children and adults, and uh, looking at various combinations of biologics, uh, and everybody um, receives multi-allergen oral immunotherapy. And importantly, does this combination of biologics actually improve sustained unresponsiveness? So does it improve safety and efficacy of desensitization? and also tolerance um, or sustained unresponsiveness. So we're excited about that. Um, the anti-IL-33 study, uh, I'll just highlight here. Um, this was a, uh, also um, a phase two study looking at 20 peanut allergic adults across two sites, Stanford and Seattle. It was a single infusion of anti-IL-33 and um, then there were food challenges at day 15 and at day 45. And what we see here is that 73% of those randomized to anti-IL-33 um, were able to tolerate 275 milligrams of peanut um, at a food challenge two weeks following that single infusion. And that effect uh, was sustained somewhat. 57% were able to tolerate uh, 275 milligrams of peanut, roughly one peanut, um, 45 days after a single infusion. This is just a higher threshold of 375. We still see, um, you know, some sustained responses at day 45. And what was really interesting is that we saw decreases in um, skin prick test uh, to peanut um, and also to histamine, which I which I'm not showing you. And the exciting thing about this strategy is targeting an anti-L33, which is not antigen specific. It, uh, the, these participants did not receive oral immunotherapy to their specific foods. 
And we see that we can change the threshold sensitivity. We only tested peanut. Um, but it's exciting to think about uh, these biologics in the setting of being antigen non-specific, because while 90% of people are allergic to the top nine, you know, 10% are allergic to other foods and um, more than 10% are allergic to more than the top nine um, because of uh, multiple allergies. And so thinking about a strategy where we don't have antigen specific um, mechanisms uh, is very exciting. So how will we use these agents um, either in, adjunct, uh, in adjunct with oral immunotherapy to decrease adverse events, improve treatment outcomes, or provide an alternate to oral immunotherapy with perhaps higher compliance and less adverse events uh, and time consuming nature um, of oral immunotherapy. Uh, and I wanted to end with um, uh, a very important pilot that we're running uh, food allergy affects all races and ethnicities. Um, Blacks, Asians, and Hispanics actually have more significant burden of peanut, tree nut, egg, shellfish, and thin fish allergies um, compared to uh, white Caucasian counterparts in the U.S. Um, and, you know, white Caucasians, uh, non-Hispanics are represented here in the maroon bars. Um, and all of the different colors here. And you can see across all of these different foods that oftentimes um, the uh, other races have more significant burden of, of food allergy. Um, and at Stanford, we uh, piloted a food equity uh, initiative with funding from the MCHRI um, to really try and make sure that these treatments that we're studying are available and studied uh, in diverse patient populations um, to understand if the responses um, are uh, similar um, and the mechanisms are similar. Uh, and um, this work has really been um, possible because of our partnership with the Ravenswood Clinic with Jeremiah Davis and uh, Marlene Alberon um, and Chris Warren and Frida and Christine, uh, where we provide free allergen safe food, um, as well as food allergy education um, over the course of six months with a bunch of different assessments and questionnaires. And we've had a lot of learning in this pilot of um, you know, different measures that we had to put in place to meet people uh, where they're at to engage um, uh, different people uh, in our center. So uh, I'll conclude, um, really there's lots of innovation happening in diagnosis, prevention and treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, I touched on a lot of these, but not all of these. Uh, and so the um, future of food allergy really is a multi-targeted approach, kind of addressing these three different arms um, uh, to really improve the quality of lives of our food allergic population. And with that, um, I'll end. I really am grateful uh, to our patients and our, our families um, who participated in all of this research, our very large clinical team and our lab team. And, uh, and mentorship um, from Carinado and, um, and uh, many funding sources. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shantaja, that was, that was wonderful. We're already having a lot of questions come up, which probably needs to be a lot more as well. So I do wanna jump right into that. Dr. Shantaja, thanks again for introducing and thanks for your comments as well uh, for adding. I know she's in multiple meetings right now. Um, I want to just get right into the questions. Uh, Dr. Yen asked one that's getting voted up the most right now. She asks, uh, has there been research on eating peanuts during pregnancy or while breastfeeding? Does that decrease risk? Yes. So the research, um, that's a great question. The research has been mixed during pregnancy. Um, and But the current recommendations are that if you are a pregnant uh, mom with uh, no food allergies, then it's really important to eat a diverse diet and that includes peanut. Great. A follow-on question from Dr. Yan. Also, exposure to roasted peanuts versus fresh peanuts. Taiwanese have a lot of boiled peanuts and people of Jewish descent have peanut cookies. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. 
Um, that is a great question. So uh, roasted peanut um, actually creates this Maillard reaction where perhaps some of um, the specific proteins in peanut become more allergenic. Um, this is uh, some work that's been done in mouse studies to potentially look at boiled peanut versus roasted peanut. There's actually a study under uh, underway in the UK looking at um, uh, desensitization with boiled peanut first and then switching into roasted peanut um, and uh, looking at mechanisms associated with that, whether people are more successful with their oral immunotherapy desensitization in that pathway. Um, in the United States, it's, uh, it's roasted peanut that we use for oral immunotherapy. Great. Uh, Dr. Kalaf asked an interesting question. Um, I think it affects a lot of us as providers. Uh, patients having their symptoms and trying to uh, attribute it to gluten. So he asked, can you contribute, make a comment on symptomatic intolerance as opposed to true allergy of gluten? In many patients reporting joint symptoms, fatigue, et cetera, after eating gluten. Yeah, that is a great question. So um, I didn't have time to really go into the difference between IgE mediated food allergy and intolerances. I think our understanding for wheat allergy, gluten, um, gluten can be in wheat and, and other products as well, but, uh, is, uh, growing. And so there's, you know, for, uh, those categories, there's IgE mediated allergy, which is what we think of as life-threatening allergic reactions where you have to be very careful. And, uh, and then there's celiac disease and then there's non-celiac gluten intolerance. And so, you know, I think there's a critical need for better diagnostics because there is no great test right now for that non-celiac uh, gluten sensitivity um, diagnosis, but it is a, but it is a real uh, entity and there's many patients who have symptomatic relief from avoiding gluten in their diets. Got it. Uh, Dr. Leibowitz asks, what are specifically the GI side effects? For example, do patients have colonic urticaria? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know if they have colonic or carrier. Um, we did uh, do a small uh, sub-study from our POI study uh, looking at endoscopies of those patients, but it was upper endoscopies pushing through to the duodenum. Um, and, and the main side effect from OIT is um, stomach pain, nausea, um, and uh, vomiting. Um, occasionally you can get diarrhea, but it's not very common. And the worry there is that we may be inducing eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and in that sub-study that I mentioned, we looked at 20 adults undergoing peanut oral immunotherapy. And we were surprised, and this was work that we did with Nielsen Fernandez Becker um, in our GI department um, at Stanford. And, uh, and she was a saint because she was doing endoscopies at so many various time points for these 20 adults during a three-year study. And what we saw is that peanut allergic individuals who are avoiding peanut actually have eosinophils in their gut and uh, it can increase over time um, with oral immunotherapy and uh, you know at the one year mark where they don't have symptoms. So it's not really a diagnosis of EOE and then decrease over time. So the GI side effects is a huge area of interest uh, for all of us who are doing oral immunotherapy because without doing an endoscopy, you can't really make a diagnosis of EOE. Um, and it's not something that every patient wants to undergo. Now, most people, if they're having side effects like that, they stop the oral immunotherapy and the side effects resolve. So it's, um, it's really trying to just fine tune what it is that's happening at the gut level um, and understanding kind of the eosinophil influx, are they good, are they bad? Um, but we really uh, are trying to understand that more. Great. Uh Dr. Porzi asks, can humans tolerate mast cell or basophil aplasia? Um, yes, I think so. It's an, it's an evolutionary um, you know, uh, trait when we were exposed to more parasites. So it's, the, it's a defense mechanism um, you know, that has evolved over time but uh, unclear if it's necessary um, still. Got it, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang asks, if food and environmental allergy 
are affected by early environmental exposure, is this a phenomenon of higher socioeconomic status populations or a reflection of survival beyond childhood? And also uh, by what magnitude is the lifetime survival curve moved by early exposure compared to risk of oral immunotherapy? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of that, Errol. <laughs> yeah, I was confused by the second part, but I, I, part of it, I think, is just focus on how much of the higher socioeconomic populations versus lower is playing a role here. Perhaps that's part of the focus of the question. Yeah, I mean, um, part of it is uh, educational awareness, right? You know, so early introduction requires a lot of heavy, heavy um, coaching uh, at those visits. So access to healthcare systems, which we know is um, not equitable across all parts of the country and across different race and ethnicities. Um, so part of it is education. Um, and maybe that's why we're seeing different rates um, across the different races uh, of uh, the, the prevalence of food allergies. Um, but it's something that we're very interested in exploring further. Um, and that's why we were grateful for the MCHRI pilot funding um, to get us started. Great. Dr. Friday asks, uh, could mast cell testing identify risks for mast cell activation syndrome? Yes, but oftentimes our food allergic uh, patients um, that we're studying in these clinical trials, obviously that's an exclusion criteria. Um, and, but the drugs, the biologics that we're using are often used um, to treat um, uh, idiopathic anaphylaxis where mast cell activation syndrome could uh, fall under that category. And so what's really interesting in our field is that allergic uh, mechanisms are sil similar across different atopic diseases. Um, with key players there, IgE, mast cells, base fills, which I think everybody is hitting on here, and mechanisms that target those pathways, either upstream or further downstream at IgE, will have, I think, broad effect. And so when we use these biologics in these individuals, we see that their asthma improves, their eczema improves, their seasonal allergic rhinitis improves as well. So we're not, we're, we're treating the whole allergic picture with the biologics um, and more specifically, the food allergy picture, I think, either with biologic alone um, or biologic plus oral immunotherapy, which, was, which is more antigen specific. Great, thank you. Do you mind if I ask one or two more questions? I know we're just past nine o'clock. Yeah. We get so many yeah. questions. Thanks, Dr. Tang asking, do you think new therapeutic agents, anti-IL-4, IL-33, would be able to allow a more sustained unresponsiveness for longer periods than the or current oral immunotherapy uh, do you think patients will seem to keep taking these agents to suppress the symptoms? Yes, so that's a really great question. Um, and, and I think that's what we're all very interested to understand. The phase three study looking at omalizumab is looking at um, omalizumab as monotherapy. So uh, for a short, you know, for a specified period of time. But the idea is that if it, if it does get approved for food allergy indication, that that is likely to be a lifelong therapeutic option um, and not a short term. Now, the, the real question is, is, is there a difference of when you start a therapy? So we may have the opportunity to be able to make more permanent immune challenges, turning off the allergy switch if we start earlier in life. Um, and there's some suggestion from the impact study, which I didn't have time to show you, looking at oral immunotherapy in toddlers where we see when we tested for sustained unresponsiveness, there was a trend for better responses in the one to two-year-olds compared to the three to four-year-olds. And so if we use biologics early in life, which the outmatch study is um, as young as one years old, um, do we have the potential to turn the allergy switch off and induce um, sustained unresponsiveness for these foods where you may not need the biologic as a lifelong therapy? I don't know. It's a really great question. I think, you know, um, this is why we're excited in the field. Perhaps one more question from Dr. Bonilla. Any difference in the microbiome in patients with peanut allergies in comparison with the population without? Oh, that's a great question. So that's an area of active investigation too. Um, we've done some pilot studies uh, in um, peanut allergic individuals who've undergone oral immunotherapy, and we see um, a change in the diversity of the microbiota 
uh, in the individuals who were successfully desensitized, and that was a small pilot study. We do collect stool samples um, on all of our patients who are undergoing um, oral immunotherapy. And uh, I think that, you know, understanding whether that difference exists between um, allergic versus non-allergic is really important. But I think um, in our studies, it's a wide age range. And I think age is also a very important factor for my microbial diversity. Um, and so it, it has to be a careful study, a careful and a large study um, to really understand the differences. Dr. Shantaj, I had so many questions personally myself, but we're, we're pretty much out of time. Can I ask one question that might be really applicable specifically to our outpatient docs? And I wonder, so if you Google food allergy, one of the first things that pops up is advertisements for a company, companies to do at home food testing with the skin prick. Do you recommend these tests, this type of test, or is, is it probably not as valuable as coming to obviously see your clinic? It's no doubt not as valuable. Would you even recommend these tests? Yeah, you have to be very, that's a great question, Errol. You have to be very careful on these home tests. Oftentimes um, they're IgG testing um, and not IgE testing. So I uh, don't recommend them for diagnosing IgE mediated food allergy. That okay. can really only be done with an allergist. Very, very helpful. Dr. Shandaja, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. We learned a lot and for answering a ton of questions. Thanks for the great questions, everybody. Um, hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Be safe. Hopefully stay off campus. You don't have to be here and uh, have a great week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay.